you're saying a lot of crap about them and stuff like that. Well, we are getting to that point, aren't we? You know, where you know you can actually fake somebody else, you know, and you know have a web presence as somebody else. Um, and I think it's you know it's just a change of you know time, a change of era, basically. Um, Right, so I'm starting the recorder because we are getting back to the old boring stuff for the last 20 minutes. I think next week, you know, I'll have a, a workstation observation and evaluation. So you will get uh, the questionnaire about you know, what you think of the class, what you think of the instructor, and so on and so forth. You know, some, something like that next week. Um, and there will be another person, another professor will be sitting here to observe, you know, how, how I teach the class and all kinds of good stuff like that. That's a surprise. No, no, this is something that we do every three years, um, you know, just to make sure that, you know, we are teaching classes in the class. Um, because we have had uh, faculty who um, could not figure out what to teach so about four or five weeks before the end of a semester, the professor simply said, you know, well, if you guys don't tell anyone, we'll just stop the class here, like four or five weeks short. <laughs> yeah, so the entire class just, you know, ended. You know, that course basically ended like five weeks short because the professor ran out of stuff to teach. Yeah, that would not be good. Running out of stuff to teach. Running out of stuff to teach. Yeah. Well, this is awkward. I can't think of anything. Um, you'll be surprised. <laughs> okay, so I think last time we went through the design of the system. Let me just kind of go through here a little bit. I think we have not gone through this stuff. No, we did. Okay, I think we did. We definitely went through programming tools, application development uh, tools, and commercial software. Um, you know, one, uh, programming tools is like, you know, getting your nails, screws, two by fours, four by fours, you know, four by eight, you know, boards and stuff like that to try to build a house, okay? You're using the most basic elements to build, in this case, an information system. Uh, that will take a lot of time, for one. It gives you a lot of flexibility at the same time because you can customize the end product any way you want. Um, if it is... It also has the greatest part of the risk. Well, I wouldn't say greatest, but it's, it, it has a lot of risk factor involved. Because with something like that, you know, it depends a lot on the developers, you know, people who are actually writing the programs. If you have a really good team of people doing that, yes, it is a, you know, it's a very flexible option. But at the same time, you know, over time, who is going to add new features to the system? Well, it has to be someone who know the, the source code, right? To know someone who actually can read the source code. So you, will, as an organization, you will have to be responsible to maintain the software. Okay, any type of security holes, you will have to plug it. You have to discover and plug all the security holes. Um, any type of performance issue, you will have to fix it. Um, so you, unless your organization has a lot of expertise in terms of programming, security, uh, database management and so on and so forth. Um, building everything from programming tools is not a um, feasible solution. The second one, which is application development tools, is kind of in, an intermediate. You're buying, you know, cabinets, you know, as a whole from Home Depot. So you know, it's already pre-built. You don't have to build everything from scratch. So it's kind of like an intermediate step. Commercial software is basically building, you know, even bigger you know, portions you're installing PeopleSoft, okay? You're using PeopleSoft, so the only thing you have to do is to customize the software for your organization, okay? Um, you are kind of limited by the capabilities of the software. In other words, if the software is only set up to do payroll in a certain way, you kind of have to you know, modify your organization so that the software, the commercial software, can do your payroll. So you cannot do payroll and say, okay, I want to do my payroll this way, but if it doesn't fit the software, you cannot do it that way. But at the same time, you are not responsible to maintain the software anymore. Okay, if there's any security holes, you know, whoever is publishing the software is responsible for that. 
if there are any performance issue, you know, whoever is you know uh, publishing the software has to do that. So there are uh, a lot of you know um, advantages to using commercial software, basically pre-built solutions that you only have to customize. It's kind of like you know buying a house in a neighborhood where everything is kind of like pre-built. So they only offer the, like four uh, floor plans. So you can only choose you know the color of the paint, the, the carpet. Um, you know, certain types of things that you can customize. Do you want a balcony or not, you know, and stuff like that. But for the most part, you know, the floor plan is already fixed, okay? And the last one is a turnkey system, which means it is not someone in your organization, but it's basically, you know, someone who is going to, you know, do everything, including the hardware and the software. Um, you're contracting out your IT or IS information system service to another organization. It's good in a way because you know you don't have to deal with it at all, and it depends on the partner you know who you are contracting the project to. If it's IBM, it's good in a way because you know IBM usually stands behind the product, and so you know so do most other companies you know doing the turnkey systems. But you have to kind of think about, but what if that company goes away? Okay, if you use the turnkey system which is information system in a box that somebody else put together for you, okay? What if that company goes away? You end up with a box and you have no way to maintain it because even the source code is not available to you. So it only works you know, in larger organizations you know, and it also depends on you know, who you are contracting this out to. So it says right here, you know, basically the same thing. A turnkey system might seem like a quick and easy solution and it looks attractive to many project teams. Like commercial software, however, a turnkey system must be extensively evaluated to determine whether it can satisfy system requirements because you're looking at a black box for the most part. You don't know what is in the box, so it makes it you know, even more difficult to evaluate. And here it says, you know, what is the, uh, the best solution? Uh, we talked about this already. It's basically, you know, just uh, cost effectiveness and how much risk are you exposed. Okay, those are the two main factors when you need to consider: is this system really the best solution or not? Now, I can give you one example right here of you know how to evaluate <coughs> the different options. Many years ago, you know, some of you may actually remember those times too. Um, instead of using uh, Desire to Learn for the rest of the uh, campus. Uh, we were using Blackboard. How many people actually used Blackboard in Los Rios? Nobody. Okay, so you guys, you know, nobody actually took classes back from those days. But anyway, the way we implemented Blackboard with our district was it's not reliable. Okay, you can be taking a test, and for whatever reason, it's a random reason they they could not they could not figure out. You can get kicked out of an exam just randomly and you cannot get back into the test, into the exam. Um, so it was really bad because you know, professors were complaining, students were complaining, and they had to evaluate, okay, what are we gonna do about this? Um, and then we had to evaluate alternatives to the Blackboard you know, learning management system. Um, so we have to go through you know, pretty much the same thing. We have to go through a lot of the criteria you know, in terms of um, cost effectiveness, and you know, and in this case, interestingly, is how readily the professors will are. Okay, let me rephrase that. In this case, you know, a big factor was you know the appeal to professors, because a lot of professors do not want to reinvent their online classes or content that they have, they have put into an online management system. So, and Moodle was ruled out because of that. Now, Moodle was free. Okay. Uh, it's still free, it's open source. It also works on the LAMP architecture. LAMP stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, okay? L-A-M-P. And they're all basically free products. In other words, Moodle, can, uh, from the software perspective, the use of Moodle is completely 100% free. Um, there's no obligation to pay any type of licensing fee whatsoever, depending on the distribution that you choose. Um, and it's also very efficient. Okay, you don't need a you know, whole room of servers, you know, to serve a you know, uh, district like this size. 
But they decided against it because in this case, it has to do with the quote unquote cost associated with transitioning over. Because there's no direct tool to import courses from Blackboard and make those courses available in Moodle. Uh, professors would have to basically download all the files that they have in Blackboard and manually reconstruct their online classes in Moodle, which takes time. Okay? So that's why they chose you know, Desire to Learn. In how many people took, uh, are taking another class using Desire to Learn or have taken a class using Desire to Learn? Okay? So Desire to Learn is another learning management system. It's proprietary, but it has a tool to import classes from Blackboard. And that was eventually the, the, the reason why we chose uh, Desire to Learn instead of uh, Moodle. Okay? Now, so there's a cost of transitioning because you know, some professors will say, I cannot transition over in one semester because I have all this material and I have to redo everything, which they actually ended up doing anyway, even though Desire to Learn has an import tool because by the time everything is imported, it's all at kind of the wrong places. So they have to you know, spend a lot of time to kind of you know, move things around and re-customize everything. Um, so you have to kind of you know, evaluate. On one hand, you have the cost of transitioning. And on the other hand, you have the operating cost. Desire to Learn is not an open source product. It has a licensing fee every year. Uh, if I remember correctly, when we transitioned, it was in the order of $200,000 a year or $300,000. And that's just for Desire to Learn. And it can only live on a Microsoft stack, which means you also, has, you also have licensing fees for Microsoft Windows Server, you know, server versions of the Windows operating system, uh, Microsoft um, SQL Server, Microsoft IIS, which is their you know, web server you know, technology. And those licenses can be quite expensive because you know, this campus cannot use a limited license. It has to use an unlimited license. So when you are adding on top of that, the cost of running Design to Learn on an annual basis is quite expensive. I don't know exactly how much it is, you know, but I know it is quite expensive. So you're looking at one-time transition cost versus you know, ongoing cost. But from the IT perspective, there are other factors to consider. One thing that was still kind of the, the main reason why, the other main reason they did not choose Moodle was you know, the IT people said, what if something goes wrong? What, who do we call? Now with Moodle, which is open sourced, and especially if you choose a distribution like Debian, you know, which also does not, unlike Red Hat, you know, they do not offer Surface you know, and say, we'll fix your problem, just call us. So there's no such you know, surface with Debian. It's completely you know, your responsibility, or in this case, my responsibility, to maintain Moodle. I'm actually the Moodle man on campus. <laughs> okay, The Moodle man, exactly. If anything pops up, if there's any problem, I'll be the person in charge or responsible to get everything fixed. Okay? I feel somewhat comfortable with that. I think I can fix most of the problems, do my own upgrade, you know, fix the file systems and stuff like that. Um, but some IT departments may not feel comfortable at all with that sort of thing. They want a phone number. Okay? If it's a Microsoft product, they call the Microsoft you know, techni technical support number. If it's Red Hat distribution of Linux, they call it Red Hat because they have a Surface contract. So they want a number to call someone else to fix the problem if something happens. Okay? So the question now is, if you are in charge of information technology, the IT you know, of an organization, how would you approach this problem? Open source means you, know, you kind of have to know a lot about the technical stuff and have your own resources and be ready to take the responsibility versus um, a vendor supplied solution where you have a phone number, if something goes wrong, you can say, oh, boss, you know, CIO, you know, it, this is not my problem, the product is not working, let me call their you know, number to find out you know, what kind of solution they have. What would be your answer? The second one sounds pretty convenient. Hmm? The second one sounds pretty convenient. The second one sounds convenient, you know, because, you know, it's not your a lot of responsibility can now be pushed outside of the organization instead of in the organization so it's basically risk management okay you know between open source and non open source 
Um, many years ago, Microsoft, you know, argue um, and say open source seems to be free, but the operating cost can be very high. Okay, and it depends on the organization. If you have an organization of people who are used to vendor supplying you know, the solutions, and they have no in-house expertise, um, then yes, the risk of using open source products can be overwhelming. On the other hand, if you have an organization, let's say UC Davis, okay, and they have in-house you know uh, knowledge of how to run just about anything, there's not much risk involved, okay, because they know how to do everything already. For the most part, they have people who can actually go into the source code of the kernel and you know address you know specific issues. Okay, so it's not a problem. So it depends. It, that part depends a lot on the IT department, what kind of people are in the department, and what kind of stuff they're used to doing. You know, are they used to calling somebody else to fix the problem, or are they used to you know taking responsibility and go like, okay, I think we can try to fix this problem. So that's a big consideration. You know, as an example, um, in here they're just comparing custom programming versus turnkey. Which is really two extremes, you know, of um, of this type of scenario, and they give these numbers, you know, weight and numbers. For the most part, you know, I would say this is really fuzzy, okay, because you can easily change the weighing system <coughs> so that one system is you know more prefer is preferred uh, compared to the other system. So this part is entirely kind of I would say it's a management issue more more so than a technical issue. Um, how does the project team find the right hardware and software you know, for the new information system? We talked about this already last time. For the most part, the hardware factor is out you know, for many organizations because they can use you know, cloud technology. And I think in this class, you know, we also have people con you know, expressing concern and say the government will never use cloud technology. Well, they may not use public cloud technology, but I think eventually for cost containment, the government, the government, state government and federal government will have no choice but to implement their own cloud resources. It's just a trend that they cannot ignore. There's no easier way or no more cost effective way of you know using computers these days. Are there any questions about that part? Why don't they want to? Use well, when they think of uh, when they think of cloud technology, they think you know, okay, I'm losing control of my stuff. Okay, so let's just you know, uh, use an example of the IRS. Okay, I'm just using it as an example. I have no idea what their plans are. So the IRS says, you know, by law, okay, we have to make sure that these records are safe. Okay, we cannot expose you know these you know records to anyone. Um, so naturally, it helps to enforce you know to to get the sense of security if it's running out of hardware under your control. Okay, so if you think about the IRS, IRS you know, headquarters, if the computers are in the basement of the same building, they will have this sense of security and say, okay, this is under our control, I think it will be secure. As opposed to, you know, oh, no, the computers are not you know, in, the, in the basement, they are somewhere else you know, in another state in, and they're all virtual machines, okay? And all the government federal agencies will share the same resources. So now from the perspective of the IRS, it would seem that, oh, okay, now we have to worry because the FBI are using the same you know, computer clusters. So it is possible, maybe, okay, that another agency can get into our database and get our records and then we'll be breaking the law and then there'll be a lot of consequences, right? So that's I, I think that's the major concern. The biggest concern you know, of using cloud technology is you know um, you do not feel that your computers are as safe as when you actually own the hardware and know where they are. Um, but in terms of cost effectiveness, which one is more cost effective? More, more cost effective. The FBI have their own computers in their own basement. The IRS has their own computers in their own basement. The ATF the same thing. The FCC the same thing the FAA the same thing, or versus, you know, there's one single federal, you know, super computer, you know, cloud, you know, center, and all the agencies will basically just use virtual machines, virtual servers out of that resource pool. Doesn't that bring, that will also bring up like a huge security issue. 
through like physically mm -hmm. speaking? Because now this all in one location, all the data. Well, you you, know, you definitely like, want to have a backup location. Yeah. So I'm okay. saying like um like Google, they just did a, a little show and tell on their server farm. Mm -hmm. It's like Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. There are people with machine guns and their towers and snipers everywhere guarding the place. Okay. Day in and day out. So right. Protected yeah. computer. So the if question the government did something like that, the US government, yeah. now they'll have multiple locations. So wouldn't they have to hire more security physically instead of just keeping But they already have multiple team. facilities because the RS I know, has I mean, like because it's local information is already stored there. Instead of having all the information one trying to say is instead of having one It will save actually, resources. Yeah, right? it's like diverse. Exactly. So the entire federal government can have one single place or a few you know different places to protect, you know, physically. And make sure they have you know backup power, you know, on security and all the other stuff, instead of having one per installation, you know, one at the RS, I mean, one at the Pentagon, one at the RS headquarters, and so on. So you know, it's actually, in a way, it is more secure. Um, but that's the major concern, you know, of you know organizations do not want to move into the cloud is you know they feel there's a loss of control in terms of you know security. Um, I think it's more of a coordination issue, more so than anything else. Um, all right, we are running out of time. I'll see you guys next week. Have a nice weekend. All right, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and use power. I've already got that.